Thank you, Oprah. Pay my taxes, Oprah. Welcome to Business Blaze, the only show on the internet that will cure your stupidity. In this one, the biggest giveaways that went wrong. Danny wrote this. He always does. I will read it and give my two cents. So let's crack on. I have no idea why I'm presenting in this manner. Here in the UK, we used to enjoy a weird TV show called Bullseye. We did? <laughs> it was a deeply odd hybrid of darts and general knowledge quizzing presented by a likable but hapless host called Jim Bowen, who usually fumbled his way through 30 minutes of British entertainment every Sunday night. This sounds awful. I've never even heard of this. Bullseye grew a reputation for being a largely shambolic show with awful prizes and terrible mother-in-law jokes, but despite this, it was allowed to run for the best part of 15 years before it was finally pulled from TV in 1995. I also feel, am, am I wrong? Or am I just like, because normally when you look on things from the past, you're like, oh, they were really good. I've watched a couple of shows lately, which I really enjoyed in the 90s, like The Outer Limits and Sliders, and my wife had never seen either of these shows, so I was like, oh, we gotta watch them. And she likes sci-fi. And so we watched them. And I'm like, <laughs> kind of shit, aren't they? It's not really, it's, it's not Breaking Bad, is it? So my theory, I, I think TV got really good at some point, because you, like, if you hold Sliders, like, super popular 90s show, and compare it to, like, Breaking Bad or Mad Men, it's like, what the f are we doing? This is how we used to spend our time? And don't get me wrong, I still love sliders, it's great. But those awful prizes became the stuff of legend. And don't forget to be a legend and watch this whole video. <laughs> there's something great at the end. No, there's not, but watch anyway. <laughs> Towards the end of each show, the last standing contestants would face Bully's prize board, where they would get the opportunity to win a range of truly fabulous prizes, in quotes, <laughs> including a trouser press, a couple of stylish suitcases, a cuddly pink hippo toy, a carriage clock. Where's a carriage clock? Some plates and saucers and shit. And a novelty Mickey Mouse telephone. All of these prizes sound absolutely shite. Can I say shite? Does that mean I won't get demonetized? I, get, well, I guess we'll find out. At the very end of the show, the contestants would then have a tough decision to make. Would they be willing to gamble all of these life-changing prizes? in the final darts challenge of Bullseye. Oh my god, the excitement! If they lost, they'd be walking away with nothing more than their bus fare home. If they won, they'd get to keep the prizes, along with Bully's special mystery star prize, which was hiding behind a screen in the TV studio. God, this was pretty intense stuff back in the day. Yeah, this, as I just said, this sounds, does sound pretty shite, doesn't it? Now, you have to bear in mind that nearly all of the contestants were British working class darts players and pub quizzes. The idea of a dream star prize would probably be a new car or a booze-filled long weekend in Tenerife. And to be fair, they sometimes got that kind of thing. But more often than not, the screen would slowly lift up and eventually reveal that the mystery star prize was in fact a speedboat. Well, that's kind of awesome. Although I don't know what, like, what do you do with a boat? <laughs> like my use for a boat would be, although I do live near a big river. Having a speedboat go down the big river would be pretty kick-ass. But I imagine the speed limits on the river and I'll get in trouble if I'm just absolutely blasting it through the city on a speedboat. These contestants, who were quite likely to live in tower blocks or council housing estates, had been given a speedboat to drag home and show off to their equally bewildered neighbours. <laughs> what do you do with that? I often wonder if there's a warehouse somewhere in Britain containing all the abandoned speedboats won by the lucky contestants over 15 years of bullseye. <laughs> it kind of all sounds pretty awesome, to be honest. Like, you go on a show, you win a completely useless speedboat. I'd love that. Although I guess, you know, if I needed a car, I'd much rather win a car. If I needed just a holiday or money, I probably, or a tr trouser press. I could probably find a, tr a trouser press would probably be more useful. It may seem churlish to mock TV shows and corporate brands who were only trying to be nice and give us free stuff, but ended up getting egg on their faces. However, we've got about 20 minutes to spare, so let's crack on. I'm pretty sure the Oprah Winfrey show has a much bigger budget than Bullseye ever did. <laughs> Yes. <laughs> in fact, I would hazard a guess that the amount of money Oprah earns in about half an hour would be more than enough to fund another 15 years of bullseye. Oprah's a billionaire, right? But the show's budget ultimately didn't have really that much to do with what is now considered one of the biggest TV giveaways of all time. Back in 2004, an episode of the Oprah Winfrey Show, God, that's hard to say. <laughs> Back in 2004, an episode of the Oprah Winfrey Show actually gave away a surprise free Pontiac G6 sedan to every member of the studio audience. All 276 of them. I've got no idea what a Pontiac G6 is. It is... 
It is literally the most generic looking car that I have ever seen. <laughs> Although I guess if you're gonna buy 276 of them, you can't just be like, yeah, we're giving away Ferraris. It was quite an expertly crafted slice of daytime television. Oprah initially made it out that she was giving away just 11 free vehicles to school teachers who had been plucked out of the audience and given this surprise gift in recognition of their hard work. Then she announced that a 12th and final car would be given away to one more lucky member of the audience, who by this time had been all been given a gift wrapped box. The idea was that one of these boxes contained the keys to the final free car. In a triumphant, oh, this is pretty epic though, right? In a triumphant TV moment, it turns out that all of the gift boxes contained a set of car keys as Oprah ran around pointing at individual audience members shouting, <laughs> And that moment on TV was intense. To be honest, that part dragged on a bit. It did. This is, I, I've never seen this episode, but I've definitely seen that. It's like the moments for Oprah everyone's seen. Tom Cruise jumping and screaming on a couch and Oprah shouting, everyone wins a car. I know nothing else and I've seen nothing else on Oprah. And hopefully I never will. I don't know, is Oprah bad? Daytime television is generally terrible, so let me know if I'm judging Oprah too harshly. The whole idea had sprung up from a chance meeting between Oprah's best friend, Gail King, and an executive from General Motors, Pontiac, brand who was on a flight. Gail had initially persuaded the executive to donate 25 cards to the Oprah Winfrey show as a cunning marketing exercise for Pontiac. Wow, Gail is a persuasive woman. But this quickly snowballed into 276 free cards with an estimated cost of around $8 million to the company. How much is a G6? Hey Siri, what's 8 million divided by 276? What? A -T -E -A Alright, I'm just gonna carry on. Shut the f up. You can only assume that the flight attendants were really on the ball with topping up the wine glasses on that day. It's worth noting that Pontiac would only survive for another few years before the brand was. What the f is up with Siri? How can it be so sh it's worth noting that Pontiac would only survive for another few years before the brand was hit by financial problems and eventually shut down. Although this had nothing to do with the Oprah giveaway, you can't help but thinking that some of the executives weren't always making the sharpest decisions in the le years leading up to the downfall. After the initial thrilling excitement of the giveaway, a problem emerged which turned the whole thing into a bit of a car crash. Ba Although Pontiac had donated the cars for free, and the TV show had paid out thousands of dollars for the sales tax and registration of each vehicle, there were other hefty taxes to consider, which the audience were left to deal with themselves. Yeah, I think I thought this was it. Like, they had to pay some sort of gift thing, right? Although it's often wrongly reported that the audience members had to pay gift tax. Sorry, Danny. <laughs> That's not quite right. If the cars had been officially identified as gifts, there wouldn't have been a problem. But, as the whole thing was legally considered to be a promotion for Pontiac, this means that the cars were seen as competition prizes and the winners had to stump up federal and state income taxes on their vehicles. So each audience member was now suddenly faced with an average bill of around $7,000 to pay. Sh I, and look, I don't want to judge the people who go to Oprah, but I'm betting if you've, like, if you're watching daytime television, you're already not employed. If you're going to be an audience member in daytime television, you are really, really, like, hardcore not employed. <laughs> Although some of them were teachers, right? I guess they got special leave to go and watch Oprah being filmed. <laughs> Yay. Where's Mrs. Fletcher? Oh, uh, she's gone off to watch Oprah being filmed. <laughs> da, 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 da. The problem here is Oprah had been very keen to give away the cars to an audience that genuinely needed them. A screening process had taken place before the recording of the show in which potential audience members were asked how they got to work, the age of their current vehicles, or if they owned a car at all. Wouldn't it be a bit obvious when, like, at the Oprah studio, everyone, there's like, you know, I assume people come, it's America, they drive their cars there, and it's like, on that day, the parking lot's completely empty. Everyone's arriving by bus or they just roll up in complete sh boxes. <laughs> and they're like, wow, did they select us because we're poor? <laughs> and you can imagine there's also other people who's like, they don't drive because they got like seven DUIs. <laughs> and they get given a car and they're like, oh no, I have a car. <laughs> I just lied on the application about why I can't drive. <laughs> so the idea was that the studio would generally be filled up with people who couldn't afford to buy a new car. Bearing that in mind, it's a shame that nobody stopped to consider that most of these 276 lucky winners would now suddenly be lumbered with a big tax bill that they couldn't afford to pay. Yeah, it's $7,000, that's a load of money. Nothing. 
There's a few different ways of looking at this. In an ideal world, Pontiac would have paid those extra taxes as part of the promotional deal. Or considering how generous that company had already been, maybe Oprah's team could have put their hands deeper into their own pockets to ensure that one of the biggest daytime television moments in of all time ran as smoothly as possible without any nasty bumps at the end. It's not like Oprah's short of a few quid. Let's try it again. Hey Siri, how much is Oprah Winfrey worth? Unfortunately, many of the winners ended up taking their sob stories to the press, complaining that Oprah had landed them all with a giant tax bill. She did give you a car, though. But that seems just a little unfair. For starters, it's not like those extra taxes came as a massive surprise later on down the line. After the recording of the show had wrapped, Oprah took time to explain taxes to the studio audience and offered a cash alternative if they didn't want to take the car home. Back then, a brand new Pontiac G6 was worth about $28,000, so a cash alternative was a pretty good deal. Yeah, it's okay. You can't take your story to the press and be fussing about it when they're like, or you can have a cash and you can buy a car for like $20,000, pay the $7,000 tax bill, and have $1,000 left over. For petrol, <laughs> I guess. A shrewd amount. How was that average? That car was $28,000? It looks like such a piece of shit. A shrewd member of the audience could have taken the car home anyway, sold it immediately for far more than its original value on the grounds that it was one of Oprah's famous giveaway cars. Could they have, though? <laughs> like that Pontiac G6. Does anyone want that, really? <laughs> I have a feeling they had to give them away because no one likes them. Whichever way they played it, each audience member had turned up to attend the taping of a daytime television show and walked away with tens of thousands of dollars that they weren't expecting. Alas, many of them just chose to vent their anger in the press, which seems a tad ungrateful and ultimately soured one of the biggest giveaways of all time. Seven years later, Oprah learned from this mistake when she gave away 276 Volkswagen Beetles to every member of the audience during the very last season of a long-running show in 2011. This time, Volkswagen had agreed to pay all of the taxes, and there were no unexpected bills for the audience. However, the audience had to wait a while until they got their hands on the cars because they were the new 2012 models, which wouldn't roll off the production line for, a, for another 12 months. And yes, they complained about, about that too. Holy sh**, Oprah's audience suck. It's like, hey guys, I gave you all a car, 276 cars. That's like 520 cars that I've given away. Oh no, 550 cars that I've given away. You, Oprah. Pay my taxes, Oprah. We'll come back to the television studios in a moment, but it's not just TV shows that can get giveaways completely wrong. Sometimes those kind corporations. All right, Danny's changed his tune. Last time we had like an entire page where he just slags off companies. He's the perfect writer for business, Blaze. Uh, where they like to give away stuff for free, but end up making a bit of a hash of everything. Back in 1990, Coca-Cola was keen to give away $4 million worth of free money stuffed inside their Coke cans as part of their biggest ever marketing campaign at the time, rumored to have cost the company about $100 million to implement. Wow. <laughs> it's interesting, like, yeah, the prizes are like 4% of the total amount we're spending on this. The idea was that not every can of coke perched on the fridge shelves of your local store would be a regular can of coke. Some of them would be special magic cans containing a spring-loaded mechanism which would eject a random amount of cash from a sealed compartment as soon as you opened the can. The winnings could be anything from $1 to $500. Of course, these magic cans had to look and feel exactly the same as a normal can of coke, so the consumers couldn't easily identify which cans were likely to contain money. I actually, I know this story because I made a Today I Found Out video about it. You can YouTube search it because I probably won't link to it below. And if I do link to it below, it's entirely possible that I have just rickrolled you. You'll have to click to find out. <laughs> this is really going to backfire when I have like a sponsorship on this channel. It'll be like, click below to check out Skillshare and it'll just be a rickroll. And Skillshare will write me and they'll be like, Simon, we need to make good. <laughs> I'll be like, Far. Make goods are the most depressing part of doing sponsorships because it's like you do the whole sponsorship read and then it's like, oh, I forgot to include the link in the description. And they're like, we need another one. My soul just died a little. A magic can would obviously contain less cola than a regular can, so the sealed compartments contained extra water to offset the weight difference. You didn't really want to be drinking the stuff that had a dollar note floating around inside it, so the water in the compartment was mixed with chlorine and stinky ammonium sulfate to put you off. That sounds awesome. <laughs> However, big problems rose to the surface when it turned out that the smelly mixture was occasionally leaking into the rest of the can, making the Coke completely undrinkable. One 11-year-old boy from Massachusetts hit the headlines when he was taken to hospital after accidentally drinking the foul liquid, although reports that he died, holy shit, were grossly exaggerated. He was just taken to hospital as a precaution was absolutely fine. That's so weird. So the media exaggerated that this kid died after being taken to hospital, but it turns out he was completely fine. That's so strange. Why would the media exaggerate something like that? 
weird. This led to a slight tweak in the advertising campaign, which involved Jordan Knight from New Kids on the Block. I've heard of New Kids on the Block. I don't think I've ever heard of Jordan Knight. <laughs> is this, is he, was he one of these dudes who was famous in the 90s? Like, uh, oh my god, I was having such a laugh uh, listening to that H3 podcast where they get the guy from Sugar Ray <laughs> to fire one of their employees. Oh, it's the best thing I've ever heard. I'll link to it below, or maybe I won't. It'll just be a Rick roll. Uh, basically, this guy warned that if you have a winning can, don't drink the liquid. What a great slogan, Jordan. <laughs> this must surely have broken some sort of regulations on product description. I don't know about you, but I would normally be inclined to buy a can of Fizzy Pop when I'm feeling a bit thirsty. I'd probably just feel slightly annoyed if I got back to my desk and it turned out that my can of Coke contained an undrinkable liquid and a very soggy dollar bill. Yeah, it's like if there was a hundred dollar bill in there, I'll be pretty pleased. If it was just a one dollar bill, they'd be like, oh great. So I got like, how much is a Coke? Coke's gotta be like a dollar, right? It's like, I got a dollar back from my Coke, brilliant. <laughs> yeah, so you just gotta go back to the store and buy another Coke with that same money. That makes no sense. Although the original plan was to distribute 750,000 magic cans among 200 million normal Coke cans, the whole campaign very quickly got pulled within a couple of weeks. Coca-Cola also played a role in a disastrous joint promotion with McDonald's in Japan in 2006. The fast food restaurant was thrilled to announce that no less than 10,000 lucky Japanese customers had won a USB stick MP3 player, which contained 10 free tracks. It's probably that shitty album by U2, wasn't it? <laughs> Unfortunately, nobody at McDonald's bothered to ask the customers if they wanted a side order of a Trojan virus with that, or U2's latest, and not, and it wasn't, it was just a virus. Which is worse? Which is worse? I mean, that U2 album was bad, but I'd rather not have all my it turns out that many of the sticks were accidentally infected with the QQ Pass Trojan virus, which quickly got to work on stealing your login data and passwords as soon as you plugged it into a PC. Well, sh Conspiracy theorists were quick to accuse McDonald's of deliberately trying to harvest the data of their customers, although it was actually just a massive flame-grilled cock-up, which ended up costing the company a fortune as they set up a 24-hour hotline and recalled all infected devices. I'm just going to go back to flame grilled cock up. Ba -bum -bum. <laughs> Meanwhile, new California based swimwear startup Sunny Co. Clothing found themselves in trouble in 2017, ooh, a recent one, when a free promotion became more successful than they ever dared imagine. The company was promoting a new Baywatch inspired bathing suit called the Pamela. This was 2017? When was that last cool? <laughs> which usually had a retail price of $65. Instagram users were invited to claim the Pamela for free if they just paid the shipping costs of $12.98, which just, yeah, it does seem a bit steep. Danny writes that, and I agree. And reposted the promo picture of a model relaxing by the poolside and showing off the suit. A fresh company like Sunnyco Clothing might have dreamed of cooking up a social media campaign with the capacity to go viral, but the issue was that it went too viral. Oh no, too much success. I wish Business Blaze was more viral. <laughs> Within just 24 hours, Sunnyco had attracted 750,000 new followers on Instagram, hundreds of thousands of post likes and reposts, and thousands of orders for the free Pamela but they didn't have anything remotely close to enough Pamelas in stock to meet demands. That's a lot of Pamelas. The company hastily tried to put a cap on the amount of free swimsuits they were giving away, but the execution of this failed to get the message across, leading to hundreds of claimants complaining that they had been charged the full $65 for the swimsuit that they hadn't received. Wait, so not only did they have to wait in a queue, but then people were, they were getting billed $65? This is why, and I don't know if you guys know this app, it's incredible, it's, a, it's called Revolut. I don't know if it's a, you, available in the US, it's quite big in Europe and it gives you a disposable credit card. So you know when you're asked to sign up to some service which you know is you're gonna forget about, it's gonna bill you again? You can use like a disposable virtual card and you just type in the numbers and then it says like, thanks for putting your credit card on file, don't forget to cancel or whatever, you know, if you don't wanna get billed. And it's like, I don't have to worry about that because like, I'll just burn, you can just delete the credit card so it becomes invalid immediately after signing up. It is glorious. I never get billed for shit that I don't want anymore. Although customers suffered long delays in getting their problems sorted, it's believed that everyone eventually received either a free Pamela or a refund, but only after a furious social media backlash, which proved to be very expensive for Sunny Co. clothing. Far more important than that, the fiasco meant that millions of Instagram users got sick to the back teeth – that's an interesting phrase that I don't know – of seeing the same poolside picture re-uploaded on their feed every two bloody minutes. But now, let's go back 
to the how long is this these have got so long lately <laughs> but let's go back to the tv studios for a giveaway that claimed to be even bigger than oprah's free distribution of huge tax bills <laughs> simon asked me to end this script on a feel-good note oh yeah i did i remember this now a uh, feel-good note with the generous tv giveaway that actually worked he suggested that we cover the time in 2016 when u.s late night talk and satire show last week tonight paid off over 15 million dollars worth of medical debt resulting in technically the biggest ever giveaway on television i have agreed but i've managed to uncover a slight downbeat angle to the whole thing hooray hooray i think this was one of the most brilliant moments on television and i'm ready for danny to ruin it for me and everyone else <laughs> the segment came at the end of an episode of last week tonight in which host john oliver was discussing the grimy business of debt acquisition and if you haven't seen last week tonight with john oliver it's absolutely glorious he revealed just how easy it was for any old idiot to start up a debt acquisition company purchase a portfolio of debt from another company and then use threats and aggressive tactics to reclaim the money from the original debtors who clearly couldn't afford to pay it back yeah it's shifty in fact especially when it's medical debt it's like yeah you owe us 100 grand because we had to repair your fractured skull from a car accident that wasn't your fault it's like oh brilliant thanks well that's me ruined <laughs> just be like it, i guess i declare bankruptcy or it's more worse when you can actually afford it so you've got like i don't know a two hundred thousand dollar house that you've paid off and they're like well you're gonna be mortgaging that and giving us half the money the last week tonight team knocked up a cheap and basic website purporting to represent a new debt acquisition company based in mississippi which they named carp after the bottom feeding fish fucking appropriate on the strength of this and with very little ease the team were astonished how quickly they were given an opportunity to buy a portfolio of 15 million dollars worth of medical debt owed by over 9,000 individuals in texas the new website offered the chance to snap up all of the debt for the bargain basement price of less than half a cent on the dollar so that came to just under sixty thousand dollars for 15 million dollars of debt that's insane it's like i feel like i should just go borrow 15 million dollars just wait a few years i mean i don't think any of these guys are really in prison they just get angry letters and then it's like yeah i'll just pay back the 60 000 thanks <laughs> carp bought the don't do that that's not recommended <laughs> carp bought the portfolio of debt and were immediately granted all of the names addresses and social security numbers of the 9,000 individuals who now legally owed john oliver and his buddies a total of 15 million dollars and who could now be harassed threatened and intimidated by carp until they coughed up of course the last week tonight team weren't very interested in doing that in a move designed to topple oprah's previous triumphs they decided they wanted to officially forgive the debts and so it was that john oliver took to the stage and said with a triumphant cry of F you oprah he pressed a giant red button which effectively wrote off 15 million dollars worth of medical debt but was this really the most generous giveaway on television well not quite the thing with debt is that it gradually decreases in value every time someone tries to collect on that debt the market price drops as the years roll by and people refuse to pay declare bankruptcy or even rather selfishly go and die i guess they didn't spend enough on their medical care the debt acquired by last week tonight team was out of statute medical debt which meant that over four years had passed since the debt was accrued and according to texas law the debtors could no longer be sued for non-payment in other words the debt was almost completely uncollectible anyway a couple of things there while the value of the debt i understand that the market value is reduced but the amount like the official amount owed is still 15 million dollars even though the market value of that debt is only 60,000. and also like yeah it's uncollectible and they can't sue you for it but you can bet that those collection companies are going to make you think that they can the reason cop was allowed to buy it all for sixty thousand dollars is because that's precisely what it was worth at the time the market value of these long overdue debts had dropped to about sixty thousand dollars so that's some way off oprah's eight million dollar car giveaway that's not to say that last week tonight's show didn't do a deeply wonderful thing the whole venture was partly a comedic skit and partly an expose on the shady debt buying business revealing just how easy it was to acquire the personal details and data of thousands of individuals in debt yeah it's pretty nuts that you can just buy their name and address and social security number i think like I've listened to enough adverts on podcasts for LifeLock to know that that's pretty important. You should keep it quiet, right? All those 9,000 individuals received letters which explained that their debt had now been officially resolved. I'm sure many of them had already assumed long ago that they wouldn't be chased for it anymore. <laughs> They're just like, I had debt? What? But to end on the upbeat note that Simon had originally requested, I'm sure many of them were very grateful to get the letter and went out for a quick trip in the family speedboat to celebrate the thrilling news. But a bum bum tsh little less enthusiastic on that one i've done it twice already this episode uh okay this was another episode of business blaze thank you so much for watching thank you danny for putting this together let's give some love to sam in the comments sam does the edits on these he adds the funny memes 
And everyone's always like, Danny, you're so funny. Simon, you're so good. Who's Sam? Thanks, Sam, below. Also, you watch to the end. Because you did that, you're a legend. It's what really matters. Watch time is king. Algorithmic love. Thank you, guys. You legends. I'll see you next time. The idea was that uh. the idea was that not every can of coke